The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. You're welcome along, Sunday Papers. So I'll run you through the back pages. We'll start with the Mail on Sunday. Picture of Erling Haaland, not too impressed yesterday. City Shocker is the headline. So Man City beaten Pep's men stunned at home by Brentford as Arsenal sees five-point lead for duration of World Cup. Beneath that, Farrell not happy with underwhelming, his word, underwhelming display. Ireland beating Fiji 35-17 uh, yesterday. So it was Man City 1, Brentford 2, and then Wolves were beaten 2-0 by Arsenal. So Duff... Damien Duff has been given various interviews ahead of the FAI Cup final this afternoon and the comments he seemed to give across the Sunday papers are about needing to calm down, needing to be less angry. So Duff, I knew I needed to calm down, it seems, the last two months or so. He's decided to stop running on adrenaline and the fumes of uh, anger. Although he does say uh, dealing with a lot of people in this league does make you angry. He didn't name names, but that was uh, one of the pieces of rationale he gave. Next up, we have Sunday World Sport. So they again are going with Man City. It's a picture of uh, Ikai Gundogan with his head in his hands. City slippers is the headline there. Sunday Times then, a picture from the Aviva Stadium yesterday. Back down to earth is their headline. I mean, it does say something for the team that even when they're winning games, this has almost been treated as a loss. 35-17 after the highest South Africa win, Ireland Labour to victory over uh, Fiji. And the uh, piece is far left frustrated by poor, slow Irish performance. Sunday Independent then, they have a great picture of Guy Ringrose. He's getting a pass away but being tackled. There's a Fijian player in mid-flight. Brilliant picture. Headline is Ireland get job done. Uh, beneath that, uninspiring victory comes at a cost as injuries start to mount. Then we have a picture of Ivan Tony, who uh, I guess is sending a message of sorts to Gareth Southgate. He's um, pictured here celebrating his goal and he's got his uh, fingers in his ears. Just the ticket, Tony fails to make three lines cut for Qatar, but Brace reminds Southgate what England are missing. A similar theme on the back page of the star, Who Are You Gonna Tone? It's a picture of Tony and uh, his manager, Thomas Frank, beside him, uh, pointing at him to the supporters, just in case they couldn't see him right beside him. He's, uh, he's pointing at him as if to say, this is the guy. And uh, same picture, Thomas Frank again pointing at uh, even Tony after his uh, brace yesterday. Southgate left red-faced is the take of the mirror as Tony tears City apart. Very happy to say, Sinead O'Carroll, editor at The Journal. Been a long time. Great yes, to have you back. Thank you very much. And Conor McKeown, GAA uh, Irish independent reporter or whatever. <laughs> his answer when I asked him what's his title these days. You're very welcome as well. Thanks, Phil. Uh, just, uh, I guess, the front pages, there's a lot of football and there's a lot of rugby as well. 35-17, what have you done for us lately? The general uh, tone, <laughs> I think, the uh, rugby reporting across the board. Nobody that impressed. The big talking point across the pages really is the hit on Joey Carberry. Yeah, and, and that picture of uh, his kind of head being whacked backwards. Obviously, he was never going to come back from a HIA with that kind of whiplash. Um, and general consensus across the board that it had to be a red card, which I guess is probably progress that we're not debating these things anymore. Um, I know they're... they're the Fiji manager afterwards was saying that, but everyone just kind of thought that was laughable that he was taking issue with the with the decision. Um, it's kind of a theme across the papers for me today. Is like we all want like sports a serious business, but we all want it to be fun. So like the disappointment in yesterday is it wasn't fun yeah. like like South Africa was. It wasn't fun like Munster was on Thursday. It's like we're really miserable at the World Cup because we know we shouldn't want to watch it because of the, the big issues around Qatar hosting it. And that's going to ruin our fun, <laughs> you know? So I feel like we'll talk about some of the GA stuff as well. Like there's there's a lot of dourness sometimes around like people giving out about how the GA do things. And again, it's because we just want to have fun with it. <laughs> so I feel like some of the papers today were it just kind of feels like they're hammering that message home a little bit like there's not there's not a lot of joy to be found there this weekend for those of you listening on podcast this isn't doing you many favours but there is just an amazing a picture at the top of the Neil Francis piece it's the moment of impact really and Joey Carberry's head has been knocked back and the saliva akin to a boxer is coming out of his mouth it's a horrific picture it's the picture that rugby just can't bear to see across the papers because 
what it's going to do to participation rates and what it means at the profession and at the game. Uh, Neil Francis has, I think, line of the weekend. He said, test rugby without brutality is like Christianity without hell. And there is that point. He says, you cannot sanitise this game or limit the effect of huge men running into each other. He says, it was the only thing that kept us awake yesterday. But he does go on to say that these kind of hits, and he's been very strong in this recently, calling for massive fines for players. These kind of hits have to be eradicated. And uh, the shocking thing is, as you alluded to, Sinead, Vern Cotter, Virginia coach, very experienced uh, coach. So his response to the red card uh, yesterday was, was there foul play? What's the question? Is there a head? I don't know. How does he not know is there a head? Yeah, your analogy about boxing is like that. If you just saw that, you would think he was just punched in the face. Like if you saw that photo without, if they photoshopped uh, Fiji and out. Yeah. Like, yeah that's I think the, the picture, and again, I'm sure this isn't great for people who are listening, but the picture is made all the more kind of visceral by what it actually, like what takes up the main part of the picture is the width of Albert Tuisu's back, the blind side, the Fijian blind side who made contact. You know, like a, a punch from a boxer is bad, but that's the full weight of this very big and strong man that's coming yeah. in on top. And Neil Francis's point, which is probably like the nub of the issue, you know, test rugby without brutality is like Christianity without hell. That's fine, but this is the first generation of rugby players that have been conditioned specifically um, for their tasks. You know, you always had big, strong people that played rugby and the collisions were big. But it's a bit like defensive and offensive linemen in in the NFL. Like, they're now being specifically trained how to be explosive in the tackle. Um, and just because Joey Carberry is a, 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 an athlete, like a professional athlete and a rugby player, you know, he doesn't have extra layers of uh, insulation around his brain to... to to protect them from this. I spoke to an intercounty, a former intercounty GAA player recently who told me that he had had 11 concussions in his career. And I was a bit taken aback by that. And, and by the way that he told me, he seemed to think that that was on the lower end of the scale. Yeah. Um, so like, like 11, now he, I think he played for about 12 years or so at the very top level. A year. Um, yeah, but, uh, and I think there were, there was a couple of years when there was more than one within the year itself. So like, we are in the midst of kind of a, a great kind of awakening about the, the issues mm. around concussion. But the more you learn, I think, the more you realise that the detection of it isn't as exact a science as it probably needs to be when you have instances like this. No, they're working towards it. Uh, Neil Francis just say the weak-willed people who dominate disciplinary committees will suspend him for three to four weeks, but his crime should merit a full six months. Six months, I always find, focuses the mind wonderfully. <laughs> I enjoyed that line from him because, yeah, it, it stuck with me after I read the piece. Yeah. Uh, and then he said, if you have a career after after six months. But I think those are the drastic things that will have to happen because obviously training isn't working. Like, And one of the things about that is like we only see what's happening at matches but like these things are happening in training as well so like those numbers you can like keep adding to yeah. what we know publicly how many hits uh, players are getting but what what's happening in training is also um part of the medical history of of these guys um and also when people are making decisions about what sport to play and what sport to continue playing as an adult so um yeah with these things like like it also ruins the spectral of a match when it goes down to 14 players so like there's there's so much that rugby has to deal with because you can't just let this happen. You can't like it can't continue the way it is, um, and you can't have matches ruined in that way by going down for thirteen men, fourteen men. You know, so it's a, it's it's a, it's a difficult one. But you know, comments like that about like where's the foul play? That's the absolute opposite of what rugby needs. I know like, Bernard Jackman in the Sunday Independent said of Cotter, I was shocked to hear Cotter say in his post-match interview he didn't feel that his flanker deserved to be shown a red card. Uh, such was the blow that the out-half had to depart the field. And uh, he says the referee absolutely correct. Cotter completely wrong to question it. How does that help the uh, determination in the game to protect players? As for the match itself, underwhelming is the most common phrase I saw across the papers uh, Jack Crowley looked quite at home when he came on Joey Carberry did reasonably well while he was on the pitch uh, the point is just made it's very hard to get to the pitch of a South African game one o'clock quiet Aviva Stadium yeah, adrenaline it's, is uh, it's, in it's funny supply. isn't it we're, we're, we have the same talking points over and over like a, a lot of talk about you know the, the the attendance there was good attendance but absolutely you know atmosphere the time was wrong people are probably going out like 
Oh, having their first point of the day yeah. while the match has started um, and then we're talking about like who's Johnny Sexton, Sexton's understudy you know so the same talking points over and over um, Yeah, I think for me one of the, the things with these kind of test matches is we talk about strength and depth with the Irish rugby team and then when it comes to it do we actually have it like it's hard to figure out okay do you make one change in an important match and let someone like Carberry you know get a, get a full on experience against a South Africa or you know in the Six Nations play him against someone that's not Italy yeah. um, so he can get a bit of consistency with all the other players around being the full team because something like yesterday if you lob a load of new lads in yes they're getting experience but not really the kind they need that if Johnny Sexton gets injured or you know Ty Byrne gets injured who's replacing them so that's the test of strength and depth but that takes a lot of bravery to you know lose a match because you've started you know someone who's not your your main player. Yeah, but. totally agree. I think at Carberry, I mean, the big game he got was in Paris this year because Sexton was injured. injured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, come World Cup, if Carberry has to take over from Sexton five minutes into a World Cup quarterfinal, none of us will say, well, thank God he experienced Fiji at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. November, yeah, you know. You know? Um, and then, you know, it, he just feels so gutted for the guy. He just can't catch a break. Yeah. You know, he probably wouldn't have like you know he got, got got a full half yesterday and I said it's not a big deal like a match like that but just you want him just to get as many minutes with no injuries no HIAs um, yeah. but also good for Crowley to get that experience. Yeah. Just I was just going to say even on like on the TV in the build up we did a whole section on I mean if you were to put it bluntly it's like where is Carberry is he up to it can you know what happens if Sexton goes off and it must be incredibly difficult for him to hear this non stop I mean it's great for Johnny Sexton that throughout the papers there's a constant what do we do if Johnny is injured <laughs> conversation I'd say his ego loves it but I mean it's a weird place to be in that you know any number of two three four guys behind Sexton written off as a as a group you know almost as not quite up to it and mentally that's not easy I think it's nearly a, 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 and it has been for a while up around Roy Keane Ireland 2002 levels of you know if you can think of a player that is more important to his team than any player in any other country. Like I, I, I can't think of a player that's as key to another international team as Johnny Sexton is to the Ireland team. Partly it's because Carberry, who has been, I don't know how long, uh, you know, considered and billed to be the understudy or the backup or the even the kind of change of style in the game if it requires, has not had the chance to get a f- proper run and they've been chopping and changing underneath second but part of it is down to Sexton's durability as well mm. like it's it's remarkable that he is still able to perform the way he did last week at the age that he is you know you're talking about head injuries and concussions like a, a, you know that would be an interesting answer to a question like how many concussions has Johnny Sexton suffered in his career and you can see that the fire is still very much in his belly but in terms of s- somebody whose presence on the pitch you know, shines even above what they actually do with the ball, you know, in terms of their leadership and the aura that they give off. Sexton is, I, I think he's out on his own. I think that's the nub of the issue when you're talking about replacing Sexton. You're you're talking about replacing three different things. So you're talking about the job of the out half, like just doing the job well. You're talking about being the absolute leader of the team in a way that is very, very hard to replicate anyway <laughs> and you're asking him to be the playmaker so it's three different things you're asking one person to do whereas actually split that out a little bit yeah. okay Sexton's not here okay who's the leader who's the leader it doesn't have to be the out half like in a lot of senses it is but if you don't have that player you don't have it it's someone else has to Peter Matney you have to do it like mm-hmm. van der Fleer you're flying you're, you could be world player of the year you have to take that aspect of it grab the game make sure someone's grabbing the game at the scuff of the neck when it needs to be grabbed at the scuff of the neck yeah. like expecting someone like Carberry like Crowley who doesn't have that experience who maybe doesn't have that personality, um, personality yeah. like you're you're asking someone to replace three different things in, in one it's probably hard for those players to develop that personality while sex exactly. is there because you yeah. need to be the man to be the man you know yeah. you can't start strutting around training and telling people what to do and getting prickly with you know coaches and your own players and everything else when you're still under study to that guy you know you never know like you know I'm sure the history of world sport is littered with people who could have been great but the guy who was the player that was great was just there before them slightly before them and never got to step out of their shadow particularly in rugby where the positions are so specialised you know yeah, well, if you're an out half you either get your position as a 10 or you don't very few of them are good enough to or big enough to slot in as a 12 or a 15 or whatever like, yeah, like look at Pizzuno and Kelleher do you know <laughs> yeah. like that like 
two and having two people in a position yeah. like that is is very very unusual. So, um, and I think we had that with O'Gara and Sexton. So people like you'd hear a lot of that being like, oh, well, it's up to the next person to come along and do what Sexton did to O'Gara. But no, that's once in a generation stuff. Like, mm. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that was a perfect encapsulation of what happens when you have two characters like that. It's all at war. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they won't even talk to each other. It's not <laughs> great for the team yeah. either. Carberry seems like a very well-adjusted, nice person. Yeah, and Might it, be conducive. And do you remember to Sexton in that Leinster Munster game, like? scruffed up Carberry and like threw him over yeah. the the uh, sideline like you could tell by Carberry even then that he's like well I'm not like yeah. this is yes. this is not for me I'm playing no yes. hand yes. actor yes. part in this he had a really good game that, that day so he answered in that way but like I love watching Joey Carberry play. I love how he kicks the ball. I like I beautiful, nothing yeah. more than I love in rugby than seeing Joey Carberry kick a ball. Like it's just beautiful. But he's silky. He's like yeah. he doesn't have that same, I guess, rawness. That, yeah, that yeah, Joey yeah. Has. It's true. I mean, you do like he does seem almost too well-adjusted <laughs> a human being. It's it's a compliment to him mm. that he didn't get in Sexton's face. Yeah, but and Sexton and Raj are a different breed of. And person. even the way he moved to Munster, all of that played out like you know quite well and you know he was asked by the Irish manager to do it he did it yeah. and has made the best of it absolutely loves it down there you know so yeah you, you do talk to former players and sometimes they say you need to be a bit of a you know what to mm. be a good number 10 like it did. yeah would Sexton have moved to Munster if he was in a similar would position <laughs> <laughs> no, these, and these things are used against Carvey well we wish him well and hopefully he comes through the protocols uh, swiftly and I'd, I mean it's hard to imagine him playing any part in Saturday's game against Australia but we'll see I have a certain hesitation even bringing this story up. The reason to bring it up is that I can't think of another sphere in the world where this would be a story. So two Premier League teammates are in a relationship and open about being a gay couple. So it's in the sun, it's been picked up elsewhere. Uh, two Premier League players in the same team are in a relationship and they're open about being a gay couple is the story. Uh, but although it's no secret in the dressing room, the stars are reluctant to publicly come out. It comes after we told earlier this year, say The Sun, how a gay former England and Premier League player is in talks about becoming the first to come out in a TV documentary. They say, and brave Blackpool player Jake Daniels, 17, revealed he was gay in May after gaining the acceptance of teammates. The two Prem stars got together earlier this year. A source said, there's always a source with long, lengthy quotes, isn't there? Uh, they did not uh, see the need to hide from their teammates. And why should they? No one was remotely bothered about it. And they had the backing of the manager and the hierarchy at the club. But they decided not to come out publicly, although neither are ashamed and it could happen down the line. During the season, they want to concentrate on their football. Uh, while making a statement would be positive, it could take their attention away from their performance on the pitch. And the piece goes on to say, Gary Lineker said last month he knows of one or two gay Premier League players who've been very close to coming out. And The Sun on Sunday has told how one Prem ace could open up about his sexuality in a show currently in production, likely to be aired on Channel 4. There's just something about this story that leaves me uncomfortable. There's, a, there's an underbelly of who is it? Yeah, well, there's, there's only one reason to publish that story is for people to say who is it yeah. and who are they because you, you read the line there, they don't want to come out publicly. So this is just a way of outing them in a timeline that's not their timeline. Um, and that's something that should be well, well in our past, that mm. people get outed on a timeline that's not theirs. Um, there is absolutely nothing newsworthy about someone's relationship unless they want to make it public in a way that allows the public to share it with them because they think it, it will move society on or move football on. That is completely up to whoever wants to do that in their own timeline so something like this I think it's hidden there's a like um, there's this veneer of like oh this is great we're supportive of it well, why are you publishing it then yeah I know the, you know? the brave yeah. 17 year old footballer you know that doesn't ring true no of course it doesn't there's a, the interesting dynamic um, as Sinead brought up um, when we were discussing this in, in advance is the difference between male players and female players um, you know, oh, this is only a male sport phenomenon. Yeah, this is a male sporting phenomenon, and I think actually Mar, the, the Dublin Camogie player, spoke about this recently. That, you know, like <laughs> this story in and of itself is nearly part of it. Like there's this kind of Mexican standoff because male players will say, "Well, it's not really anybody's business." But if they did come out, well, then they would encourage more people to come out. But you know, should they have to come out in the first place? So like. <laughs> It, it's inc it's incredible how few there have been that are openly gay, but that attests to not only 
the atmosphere and the environment in which they play, the dressing room, the people in the stands and everything else, but also the public interpretation of it as well. You know, they know that th there would be no quiet way for a male Premier League player to come out and be gay. And most of the, most people who are gay who play in the Premier League, I'm sure, don't consider their sexuality to be their defining characteristic. But that's how they would be treated, and that's how they would be interpreted. And I think that's, you know, that 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 piece. Like, do you, you want to have a piece telling you that, you know, there's an openly gay relationship going on in a dressing room of a, a you know, a, a women's Premier League team, and that's kind of why. You know, they're, they're all the factors that are leaning in on top of the players that that that, that are making this such a kind of a just secretive yes. kind of yeah. thing. It's creating that atmosphere. Well we have it with the Irish team, Katie McCabe and Marisha Littlejohn are in a relationship and when they first talked about their relationship to the media they weren't kind of saying oh we're talking about it for the first time they were like oh we've been in a relationship for <laughs> years and just like mm. hey if you're interested we'll talk about it like because it might be good to, to have visibility for, for other young girls out there like or whatever but um, it's just so wildly different um, and it I think it shows the toxicity still in in male sport and in, in soccer in particular mm. that like you do know that there would be like stuff from the stands that mm. would be akin to the racism that uh, black players experience mm. so like you can see why there would be a certain apprehension because it would become less about the football then so and that's what that story says like they they are publicly out to the people who matter the people in their lives the people in the dressing room like there's obviously no like secret there so like by public we mean newspapers and the stands and that's no one's responsibility to do mm. and where does that end I mean does every gay footballer have to come out <laughs> exactly uh, like you know just, just an odd situation that football finds itself in and it has become a thing over the last couple of years and we you know Gary Lineker will come out and say oh I've had someone speak to me and they're thinking about coming out and then it goes away for a while and comes back and yeah, and this we, real sense of othering these people yeah and we probably will celebrate the first Premier League player who will come out because it will be seen as a you know a step towards openness yeah. and, I, and I think that probably will be fair and they'll be right but it has to be on the person's own wishes own timeline and if they feel like they want to take on what will become a responsibility. Like you said, it'll be a defining characteristic or a defining um, memory about that person. Well, do you think a piece like this, because uh, you said at the outset, this the problem you have with this piece, I think, is it, it, it puts a pressure on the timeline. There's a sense of, we know you're gay, we know you're in a couple, we have the details. 100%. I don't, like, I hope these two people don't feel that pressure and they think, oh, well, this, this could be two people out of the hundreds of people who are in dressing rooms across the country. But... Of course, it 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 it's it's a, it's a step and it's a stepping stone towards someone doing it, but it's it's putting pressure on. I just as an editor, I'm thinking if someone comes to me with that story, you have to question why you're putting it out. Like, what's the what's the story there? Like, are we saying it's a story that two people are in a relationship? Yeah. Are we saying the story is that they don't want to come out? So if you're saying the stories they don't want to come out, why are you publishing it? Like, what what's the ethical responsibility there to publish it? So there's a lot of editorial questions for me on publishing a piece like that because it, it's... I don't think it's even interesting, but I think their argument would be it's of public interest because no gay player has come out in the Premier League before. What irritates me about it is the faux supportive tone. 100%, yeah. Like... The, this isn't like, oh, we're all ready for you to come out, so come out, please. That mm. that's that's what it's saying, but it it's not what it's it means. So, well, we can jump around there. I mean, there's quite a few pieces you guys have uh, picked out. For instance, just as a as a, I, I, I kind of um, latest chapter in this guy's career. Page eighteen of the Sunday Independent is about Clifford and his extraordinary feats in the Kerry County Championship. I think I've lost it here. And do, but, you want, do you want me to read some of the extraordinary figures from it? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Because uh, I think he's almost taken on a mythical status. Because at one point in the piece, the line that jumped out to me is, it's no wonder people are driving from all over Kerry to see him. Yeah, not not just all over Kerry. <laughs> it, driving from all over the country to, to see him because his personal scoring tally for the season is now... 20 goals and 155 points. Yeah. He scored 2-12 um, in the Kerry Premier Junior Championship final, uh, made up of 1-6 from play and a goal from a penalty and six-pointed freeze. He counted for all of his sides 2-3 in extra time. 
he uh, blitzed his 10 point a game average with an 18 point haul to bring his tally to 455 in the competition like playing with his club team like so you're not talking about being surrounded by the best of the best like giving you the ball easily like, the system playing like absolutely perfectly with a manager at, at like Jack O'Connor level you're talking about a club team mm. and he is it, it is like you're right it's mythical like those figures are just baffling yeah like they're off the charts he's a, he's, he's, he's a ridiculous footballer the last footballer I can remember there being such an aura around was probably Morris Fitz Morris Fitz had that aura because he was he was almost otherworldly he was almost supernatural in the things he like We've had so many footballers and hurlers and camogie players that are brilliant, but there was always somebody who was able to do the things they did, but just not as well. Yeah. But what Clifford has, nobody else can do. And, and he's gotten to this stage, as these figures um, indicate as well, where he, it's not just that he can do things that other players can't, he does them every single week, and now he's doing them in the biggest games. Like, he, he illuminated an All-Ireland final that was quite a drab All-Ireland final insofar as there weren't many goal chances. It wasn't a great game. Himself and Shane Walsh produced moments of absolute sublime excellence, which is harder and harder to do now in big games with defensive systems. And I think Clifford, did he lose the Sigerson final earlier this year? Yeah. And it's the only championship that he, that he hasn't yeah. won. But he has that kind of he has that aura that Morris Fitzgerald had as well, where you know that there's one player who stands apart in terms of the things that they can do on the ball. And he is a marvel. Like, you do genuinely marvel when you see him doing do you know, these things. Do you know what else he has, though? Like, I think most people outside of Kerry don't particularly care for Kerry doing well or not. Like, it's kind of, you know, for neutrals, it's a boring All-Ireland if Kerry win. Yeah. Like, But I think most people who weren't, like, from Kerry still wanted David Clifford to win an All-Ireland. They yeah. still wanted to see him do well. And that's unusual too like no one wants to take him down a peg or two everyone wants to keep raising him up and keep raising him up no. like, I, I think he's, I think there's also th th there's a lot riding on him I think to an extent because you look at a footballer like the Gooch who was so brilliantly talented but later on in his career had to move out because because people like him and Peter Canavan were so good defences were set up that corner forwards didn't get ball or when they did they were surrounded so Gooch ended up playing out in the 40 now he was so good he played on out in the 40 equally well as well but players like that started to be marginalised to a certain degree or you didn't get to see the full range of the very stylish things they did because without space and time there was no great value in doing it you know you were always moving the ball on the corner forward's job was to come out on the on the loop and rotate and, and hand it off and it was about ball winning but Clifford is just so stylish, you know, and we love watching stylish players in any sport that we play. You talk about Joey Carberry and the way he kicks the ball. Somebody that looks, you know, we, we, we love languid players. We love yeah. players who look like they're doing something with it. And you can see the way Clifford kicks the ball, like his, the extension of his foot, like it's almost like a, a gymnast, you know. And to be able to do it, given that he knows he's going to be the target every single week mm. is, a, is, a, is a phenomenal thing to do. It goes back to what I was saying at the start about like wanting sport to be fun and like David Clifford makes it fun. Yes. And it's, there's, it's very uncomplicated watching David Clifford. Yeah, isn't it? Like you're just like, like and w one of the things that the fossil manager Adrian Sheehan says uh, to, in, to Sean McGoldrick in this piece afterwards and usually to something like this I would roll my eyes but he, the people of Kerry are very lucky to have him the people of Fossa are very lucky too. I'll tell you what it is like to manage David Clifford. It's an absolute dream job. If I said to David, go and goal, he would go and goals. He's the easiest man to deal with. You could ask him to do anything. He would nod his head and smile and say whatever you want to do. He's a complete and utter gentleman. I couldn't speak any higher of him. Usually it's stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like yeah. everyone's grand if you're talking about them like that. But like with that, I was kind of like, oh, that's nice, isn't it? That he's a nice <laughs> lad too. I was totally taken in by it. Well, he does <laughs> seem to have it too. You find, you know, you laugh them fine, but the very, very elite people, the people who know that they're the best, they might have a not a darker side, but, you know, have a kind of a, a prickly side or that can be edgy and, and that's part of, you know, the Johnny Sexton. The Johnny Sexton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but Clifford, you know, I think Jack O'Connor, the last time I was on, we were talking about it, Jack O'Connor did an interview about talking to um, Clifford before he got on the bus, before the all Ireland final, he was standing there leaning up against the bus having a coffee. He has a personality to go with it, you know. And maybe that's the confidence that comes with knowing that if you get the ball, you're going to, yeah. you know. Like, what defender does David Clifford Fear. Fear. Which of them keep him awake at night? Absolutely no. But, but there's an interesting thing too because it's been mentioned a lot in the last 24 hours since uh, Clifford scored 2-12 in this game. 
people talking about, well, it's it's junior level football. But I don't think people appreciate the, the structures that are within Kerry. You know, he's playing junior level football because there's eight senior clubs. You know, and Premier Junior is actually quite a high level. You know, like Fossil would be senior in most other counties. Right. But the Kerry also organised their competitions really well because people talk about how complicated they are, and they're not particularly complicated. But like somebody like Clifford now, from the date of the All Ireland final, he could be playing matches every week nearly until Christmas because he'll go in. He would have played with Fossa in a divisional championship, then he would have played with East Kerry in the Kerry uh, County Championship, and now he's playing with his club in the club junior championship so it was the same the, uh, with the Gooch when he was kind of the, the, the best football around and, and Dr Croaks were going all the way into Munster and everything else he was playing divisional finals as well as the county championship and the club championship so that's, in, Ker that's... in Kerry they give a great yeah you know somebody like Clifford is never going to have to go through six months or six weeks of a of a, a, an off season without playing matches the matches will come thick and fast and in Kerry they, they, they provide a brilliant programme of matches because uh, the, the piece says this was his 30th game since he featured for Kerry in the McGrath Cup win back in January. Uh, his personal tally, as you mentioned, Sinead, is 20 goals, 155 <laughs> points. Uh, next weekend, Fossa, they're back out. They play Croaks in the East Kerry Divisional Championship and then the following weekend, they begin the Munster campaign. They're playing a Limerick team. Uh, Sean McGullard does say Kerry boss Jack O'Connor may be having nightmares that David and his older brother, Paddy may never get a break from the game in 2022. And I, that's my, that'd be your only worry for 23-year-old Clifford, that even for much of this summer, he clearly wasn't fit, but Kerry still just had to play him. And so because he's so important that Clifford at 50% is still worth including in the Kerry side, I would just hate in eight years' time if he's paying the price for that. Yeah, well, like, Sinead's point about sport having to be fun. Like, Clifford, if you go through, so he played McGrath Cup back in January. During that and around the start of the league, he would have been playing in Sigerson football. Then he was into the full on National League which went very quickly into the Inter-County Championship so yeah. like Clifford hasn't had you know if you talk to Inter-County players across the, the codes they'll tell you that the two three month block of training while it's necessary from a physical uh, capacity it's not much crack <laughs> you know what I mean and this guy is literally playing matches yeah. every weekend so yeah. if he's playing matches every weekend he hasn't had to do the slog you know so you think if, uh, mentally he might be enjoying it more I think yeah I think if for a fella like this getting the ball in his hand and playing a game where he has great instincts as well as great skills and everything else yeah. and like physically he's very robust you know he's big and strong he moves very well so Maybe it's not as necessary from to have to go through that. It'll be interesting to see what happens with regards to injury. But yeah. the, the point about why he's playing so well, I would say it's because he hasn't had a break from playing matches as opposed to his momentum. He's was this on TV? Of football all the time. Yeah, like Joe is a fellow Kildare person. Like you just <laughs> always want to see like lads kicking football rather than being well, in the gym or like. <laughs> was this match on TV by the way? I think it was streamed on Facebook or something. All oh, right, okay. Because I just think that adds to the. The mythical aspect, you know, people had to drive to see it properly. And even like, so again, it went to extra time. He scored every everything Fossa scored in extra time, he scored. Yeah. He just scored 2-3 in extra time. Yeah. For people who can't hear the smile on your face, like this is like... It's the kind of thing you'd be saying about, <laughs> and then Christy Ring scored 2-3 <laughs> in extra time. You know, you had to be there. You're alive for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The interesting oh, thing, uh, I, I, I thought in the preview of it, because I saw a couple of people writing about, Colm Keyes in the end wrote about this on Saturday. Um, the interesting part was that and I had no idea, he billed Listry, the team that Fossett beat yesterday, yeah. as the favourites. So, like, what sort of standard of football is there in Kerry that in the in the junior championship, the team that has David Clifford and Paddy Clifford are outsiders to win a semi-final, you know? So that, that kind of just tells you, it's, it, it, it's not as if this guy is playing nine levels down below himself and shooting 212. You know, that's a serious standard of football there yesterday, regardless of whether it says Premier Junior or, yeah. or whatever else. Pat Spillan, you picked this out Connor in the Sunday World he highlights a problem I think we're all very well aware of really rural clubs uh, playing a numbers game they can't win so he's talking about his home club which is beating the odds in a massive way Temple No, they have 100 members in their club they were in Division 5 for years it's gone full circle they have like a golden generation now so they're doing really well but he said we're the only rural based club playing in the county senior championship the other Seven clubs come from Killarney, Trilly and Dingle. Three from Killarney, three from Trilly, one from Dingle. And he says, we're going to have bad days again because we have so few players. He said Valencia Island didn't field an adult team in 2022. And then he just goes through uh, counties around the country and it's a similar story. So he says in Cork, Hurley and football finals contested by the three city clubs, Nemo, 
Black Rock, St Finbars, the Clare Football Champions, Airog based in Ennis, Waterford and Limerick senior hurling titles claimed by City based Bally Gunner and Napiershig. Kildare, Nace won the football and hurling double for a second year in a row. And Camogie. And Camogie. Yeah. So it's not the double, but they won the Camogie, yeah. Okay. And he says they're a one town club in an area with a population of twenty one thousand people. The club has three thousand members and has a hundred teams. He says in Dublin Super clubs dominated both codes. Kilmacud beating Nafina in both the football and the hurling deciders. He mentions Clonmel in Tipperary. He mentions Port Arlington and Leash. You're getting the picture. Uh, three of the Mayo semi finalists Westport, the winners, Ballina and Castlebar Urban Clubs. Uh, he says there are a few exceptions like Kilku and Down. But really, uh, the problems facing the GA are a mirror image of the issues facing society. And uh, there is then a wonderful detour, which I do like, where he said. Uh, it made my blood boil when I uh, read at the weekend that the government gives €42 million Euro in prize money, which is tax-free to the horse racing industry. This is the kind of horse shit, he says, <laughs> excuse the pun, which must be challenged. He said there's a big divide in rural Ireland and he says the big farmers and the horse breeders, thanks in part to the taxpayer, are doing very well, but the peripheral uh, smaller farmers aren't. And he says wealthy horse breeders and owners make more, have more than enough money and are more than capable of looking after themselves without the uh, taxpayer. So we all know that's a problem. No obvious way to fix it, I suppose. Yeah, and, and the super club thing obviously transformed Dublin, you know, and it's kind of been hand in hand. Like if you go to one of the super clubs in Dublin, like the the amount of participation is what you want to see in the GA. And yeah. like, you know, especially at underage level. Um, and that's, you know, coming through. Um, and they're often well run, lots of volunteerism, they're vibrant, like it, yeah. they're great. You don't so, want to so you don't want to tear that down. No. Um and you don't want to give them Shane Walsh either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably, you know, and there's probably things that you can do population wise that like, okay, there's probably a like time for a new club to set up, you know, that that kind of thing. Like, you know, I'm not saying like split St. Jude's or like split Nace in two or whatever, but like... Um, Is that the talking kill there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like, I, ca I can't talk about Nace because give them ammunition to meet us again next yeah. year. Um, but like, you know, it's great to see, like as a Kildare person, it's great to see like teams like Nace doing well in, in Leinster or whatever. I say that, I don't really mean it. No. Like, it's great to see. It's, it's great to see in theory, not in practice. We <laughs> really don't mean it. <laughs> um, but rural depopulation is a whole other beast and... Yeah, and like you're probably hoping that COVID will change things. There's a lot more working from home. People are moving back home. That might move the needle a little bit. Um, Not if Elon Musk has his way. <laughs> yeah, like none of that has shaken out yet. Not just in Twitter, but anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's a, I guess Splan is right. It's a society thing as well as a GA thing. But I guess world GA clubs do have to do their work as well. You know make sure the infighting that's kind of typical in, in GA clubs doesn't happen, like maybe learn from some of the setups. OK, you mightn't have eight minor teams, but like make sure your minor team is well run. Make yeah. sure that like the kids stay around, that whenever you're playing matches makes sense, like let them have fun. Like don't put, you know, drinking bans in place if your senior team is all in their 20s and want to have a bit of fun. Is You know, make training not a slog. So there's probably a lot of stuff that, that can be done to keep people interested at a level that's not... Um, counterproductive, you know the way like GA teams sometimes ask an awful lot of. Well, I'm always amazed of people. At, um, people still travelling back from Dublin, two, three, four hour drives to play matches and go to training sessions. Yeah, in, well into their twenties. I'm amazed. Like that poll is is incredible. But obviously, if you've only got X number of people in your village, then it's difficult. Amalgamation has been really the way of the last decade. But it kind of, I suppose, what Pat is kind of, the, the picture that he's drawn is, is one that's becoming increasingly kind of legible. It's very, it's very clear and apparent. There are fewer small clubs winning county championships at senior level um, for the same reasons that there are fewer people living in small villages in Ireland. Like, and it takes away one of the great kind of, I'm looking to use the word narratives, but like one of the great kind of annual stories, you know, a Lockmore Castellani playing every weekend in football and hurling or a Kilku going all the way to an all Ireland final, you know, and beating a team like Kilmaco Croaks. Like we rejoice in those stories because, you know, it's the classic underdog thing. But yeah. but increasingly it's not going to happen. And the problem is, you know, the super clubs don't get a whole load of love, um, which is understandable, but it's kind of like, well, if people are migrating to the cities and we're saying that the super clubs are too big, well, then people just don't play Gaelic games. You know, like if that, that's the alternative. You know, like huge clubs in Dublin, the strain that are on um, 
the strain that's on not only volunteers but also pitches and you know like facilities it's it's a it's a fair struggle to kind of be able to do that and the alternative is is you don't do that and you don't try and cater for the you know the young people from the schools you don't go like dublin hurling would be a very classic example of like a part of ireland where hurling would have had no penetration whatsoever is kind of the leafy south side um and now that's actually the stronghold of mm. hurling in dublin so uh, you know whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing um, like it's good for hurling that it has penetration in a different part of the country. Yeah. Um, but the upshot of that and the consequence of that is what Pat is outlining here. It's harder and harder for small clubs to compete at that level. And every so often the GA puts together a think tank. They put together some sort of a you know a, a group of smart people who are supposed to examine these things. But it's like like how do you how do you reverse this kind of urban drift like it's like trying to stop coastal erosion or something yeah. this is a natural process that has happened at a societal level um the world over the world over and you know the GAA can never really do anything to stop it in this country Paul Rowan on page 15 of the Sunday Times gives a quick review of Martin O'Neill's new book not great I think is the <laughs> sentiment. He says here, O'Neill may pull back the drapes, but the neck curtains are very much still there. And much of the controversial stuff revolves around what was said in or by the media rather than any inside glimpses behind the scenes. So, he gives that's a, not a great selling point. No, he also gives a rundown of interesting things that he knows happened to O'Neill and... That he says nothing about. That are not in the book, so I think there's probably more uh, stories about O'Neill in this half page in the Sunday Times than there is in the entire book. In so much as I can see from all his interviews, it seems to be just an exercise in what mean thing can I say about Keith Andrews in this particular <laughs> interview. Like even his Guardian uh, piece, and I can't think this would be especially interesting to Guardian readers. So he says, uh, this is in a piece Thursday I read it, and he says, what jars in relation to Keith Andrews is his position with, within O'Neill's profession. So what O'Neill says here on, on this particular interview is, if Roy Keane was doing punditry work and said I'd made a mess of something, I might disagree, but I would accept it from someone who's played at that level, has managed himself, knows the pressures you're under. I have a level of earned respect for that opinion, but not a lower leaguer who wouldn't know what it's like to win a medal and who's now finding it difficult to win football matches himself. Every time I read a Martin O'Neill interview, he's like, and now for the Keith Andrews <laughs> section. It's just, this has not been an exercise and, and the whole, outs I'm an outsider, you treated me like a northerner. It's been an odd hey, um, Paul Rohn had, selling point. Uh, uh, makes the point that he was referred to as a northerner only by the Irish Times. So O'Neill has said like it was the media, um, yeah. but like one reference in one newspaper, you know, that's... I never got any perception at all that Martin O'Neill was... You know, in the general conversation, regarded as a northerner, as opposed to an, like I, I have to say, I'm I'm su I'm shocked that like you can't tell somebody else that their that their feeling of something is, yeah, is yeah. invalid. But I'm shocked that that's the over like whatever you say about this person was too critical. That person doesn't know what they're talking about. I can't, and I'm just I'm I'm really surprised that that is the I thing that O'Neill generally felt. people have been surprised. Yeah, that, that was his experience. Like, and the point about Keith Andrews as well. Like whatever Keith Andrews did or didn't do as a player. You know, that argument of what, what have you won, where's your medals? Like, Sorry, can I like, just like, say... How would Jürgen, like, Jürgen Klopp didn't win anything. Can Neither I, Jose Mourinho or Arsene Wenger before they became managers. So Can like, we just say as well, Keith Andrews was the best Irish player across about two to three seasons. <laughs> he was player of the, uh, the uh, championship at Euro 2012. I know that wasn't a great tournament, but he was bloody good at it. And if you watch the France game, the Henri handball game, Keith Andrews was exceptional in that game. Yeah. Graeme Souness over on English television made a point of picking out how good Keith Andrews was. He played in the Premier League. So why you call him a lower leaguer? Yeah. Like, you're the one who's so hung up on facts and get your facts right. He's like, he's a lower leaguer. He's a Premier League player. You tend to find when managers, regardless of the code, get so hung up on specific critics and specific yeah. kind of criticism, they're kind of done and dusted, like, yeah. at that stage, you know? Like, it, it has gone a little They've bit They've lost a perspective, far. almost. And, like, the Martin O'Neill thing became very... Like, with the interviews with Tony O'Donoghue at the very end, you're just going, this guy is has an awful lot of pent up resentment for whatever has come this way and I'm not sure that the media I'm sure if you're the Ireland manager the barrage of media attention and comment that comes at you might be hard to deal with but I think there's probably better ways of dealing with it than Martin O'Neill did. Yeah it's probably a pity he, he didn't talk a bit more to Damien Duff when he had the chance like Damien Duff seems to be very open and like across the papers there he's talking about like the stuff that he's had to do to kind of maintain the personality that he wanted to maintain and not let the anger come to, to the fore um, which he said had been happening whereas with Martin O'Neill I think the idea of 
writing this book as well and expecting people to give their time to it when you haven't been honest yourself in it. I, I, I get really frustrated with that idea of a sports book that you're asking people not just to buy it, but to invest time in it and, and get people to interview you about it. And you've just done it in like a an exercise in chronology. Like I played this match then and then mm. I went and managed this team then. The and sin of omission is a big like, one in an autobiography. Yeah, like, if you yeah, know like I don't think he's been dishonest. He's just yeah, but like If you know detail. that people know certain things about you and you don't address it in, and you're going to the bother of bringing out a book and you completely ignore it. I think you know, the, the, like the, the book loses any real appeal. I'm sorry he feels this way. I have to say because I generally had a lot of kind of affection for a lot of his tenure, and when him and Roy are hugging and kissing after the Italian win, I was like, "This is wonderful!" And you know, we like the fact that Martin O'Neill, GA playing Celtic, managing O'Neill felt like an outsider. I mean, I never picked up on any of that whatsoever. No, and everyone like, wanted him as manager when... Like, oh, you know, celebration was, when he was announced. So it I'm, was like, we can't wait for this to happen. Yeah. And, like, the matches obviously became so dour by the end. Like, True, there, there was a, but a I, shift, but... I think if he walked down Grafton Street, I was saying to Dan McDonald during the week, walked down Grafton Street or was brought out the Aviva, if... if this has created a weird atmosphere now. I think the Irish public almost feel a sense of, oh, geez, there, there's a problem here that <laughs> yeah. we didn't fully appreciate. Because yeah. everybody knows you can't win every game as Ireland manager and the Denmark thing can happen and there's going to be media criticism. But that's all part of just the weird world of football. But, you know, a year or two removed from that, if he was to walk out of the Aviva, get a great reception. He's almost creating, a, a, your favourite word, a narrative there that I don't think the Irish public were as aware of until he really honed in on it. It's, yeah. a, it's a, not a great PR choice. No, especially when you want to sell a book. Yeah, 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 <laughs> well, yeah. Well, can you just think, like, Martin O'Neill would have always struck me as being a very interesting, before he took over the Ireland job, having a very interesting story to tell. And even the focus on his Ireland tenure, I think, surprises me a lot, you know, in, in, in regards to the interviews. That I haven't read the book, so I'm not sure how much of the book is devoted to his time Ireland, as an Ireland. But a huge amount, but in the interviews I've read, I read the one you and Murray, the one you referenced in The Guardian as well, the central theme is the the criticism and how things finished up and the Keith Andrews stuff. So it's obviously very prominent in the yeah. book. And I'm surprised at that because I would have thought managing Ireland, as much as we all wanted it to work out slightly differently, was probably one of the less interesting things Martin Neal did in his football career. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what size of the book it takes up, but... Uh Paul Rowan, that's his review in the Sunday Times. On Damien Duff's or Shelburne Derry this afternoon in the Cup Final. This guy can't do a bad interview, really, <laughs> Damien Duff. He can't not be interesting. So uh, the theme of what he's talking about to the Sunday papers is about how he was running on anger a lot and it's no way to live. He said, I have changed. You can't run on adrenaline and fumes and anger. It's not a way to live your life, but that's absolutely what it was. He said, people from afar that don't see me that often would often see interviews after games and say, are you OK? You look angry. It's something I've tried to address in the last two months. It did become a bit too much for me. And he talks about really appreciating now why he sees the likes of Pep Guardiola flipping out all the time. He understands the stresses. Uh, he does say, though, he's loving it. Keeps me young, jumping out of bed in the morning, being out in the fresh air, running around a pitch, working with young guys. That's not going to age you, is it? And he says, once this is done... He's going to get a holiday. He said the school won't be happy, but hey, because he's taking the kids out of school for a holiday and then he'll be on World Cup duty with RTE. And then interestingly, he is um, on the need for a break. He says, my wife's in the same boat as me at the minute. She's writing a book, so she's 24-7 as well. I don't know what it's about. It's possibly mainly about me, living with me for 15 years. <laughs> he says, she's a very intelligent woman. I don't know what she's doing with me. Opposites attract. She's the clever one in this relationship. She's written a kid's book before. She's a specialist in yoga and meditation. So uh, that's a little insight into Duff's world of late. Yeah, and Eamon Sweeney on uh, the back page of the Sunday Independent kind of sums up, I think, when you hear those interviews, how generally people feel. Like he remembers a quote from him a couple of months saying, I'm not likeable. And he says he was, Duff was doing himself a disservice with him. The drive needed to succeed as an elite level footballer has always been right there on the surface. But there's something very disarming about the nakedness of his desire to make a success of things as a manager is his inability to hide how much this all means to him and his willingness to be honest about his emotions make him seem unusually authentic in a game where garden, guardedness is prized. Um, so I think that kind of sums up how sometimes yeah, you can be the fellow who looks angry at the end, but people put that as like a likeable thing rather than... It's a sort of transparent anger. Yeah. yeah and and it, understandable and... And you know where it's coming from. Like, it's yeah. not... He's not... You know, he's not Marino and being angry with his players and saying, like, well, he's not good enough. You know, the anger is from, like, I want this to work. I want everyone to be 
doing their level best. Mm. You know? His frustration seems to be very relatable and human, you know. But for somebody who says he's not very really likable, I mean, he must, be, he must be the most liked, unlikable person of all time. <laughs> like, I remember 20 years ago, Ireland goes to the World Cup, and I think we all adopted him as our national pet nearly, yeah. you know. Yeah. Everyone, were, we, were, we were totally charmed by how much he slept. Like, that was a big thing <laughs> that Damien did. We were all obsessed with he slept for 27 hours a day or whatever it was. And he, there was something about him being the kind of, you know, the real old style winger playing for Blackburn. You know, like like part of us, I think, kind of nearly resented when he went and joined the Abramovich, Jose Mourinho <laughs> kind of uh, evil blue machine. Like yeah. there, was, there was something about Duff, I think, that we all related to back then when he was a young player at the peak of his game. And there's something about the way that he handles himself. Just, I'll name Sweeney's piece there, and I hadn't considered this until I read it. Um, the second paragraph, Eamon says, um, should Shells shock Derry, their manager will make significant progress towards becoming the next Ireland boss. That's how big this game is from. I hadn't considered that. I don't know. Um, I didn't, you know, I hadn't considered the next Ireland boss anyway. You know, I, I, I think like most people, you'd expect Stephen Kenny to be there for the foreseeable future. But m maybe that's maybe that's where Damien Duff has put himself. He would be a very, very interesting He'd have popular manager. support, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think part of the Duff thing as well is like we talked there about how much we valued him and loved him when he was playing. But somehow he still feels like he's underrated for what he did. Like... Do you know when you talk about those annoying conversations about who the greatest like sports people are? He's never in those conversations. We're like, well, he won a couple of Premier Leagues. He like, you know, he like went to World Cups. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, was a standout world class player, um, which we don't have like you know buckets of, mm. uh, you know, in the last ten twenty years. So it's um, yeah, this could propel him. If we're talking about a manager, people might start to remember as well. Like, oh yeah, like. <laughs> He did it on the pitch too. Yeah. Uh, just a final point before we finish up. It's kind of noteworthy. I don't think this has ever happened before in the history of football that we're seven days out from a World Cup and there's very, very little in the papers about it. Yeah. I noticed during the week it was the first time I noticed and I went looking, I think. Um, there were a couple of previews online on some of the media that I'd read of the work, you know, a kind of a, 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 a country by country who's the captain, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The sort of usual build-up stuff. But I can't, you know, part of it is obviously the timing, but part of it's like we're at a very interesting point in this story now because so much of the build-up is about Qatar, whether it should have been host, why is it hosting, all the things that it does wrong. People, um, like there has been a lot, not an awful lot of good journalism around mm. um, Qatar's use of migrant workers, how they treat people, um, their human rights issues that we all kind of diagnose from this part of the world. Um, but now the tournament's going to start, so it's going to be interesting to see how much of that, like a, a lot of the journalists that have done very good work into this will now be at the tournament. So, yeah. you know, do they get caught up? You know, it's a little bit like the when the, the rumble in the jungle happened in Zaire and they locked up all the criminals and the, and the like, you can't imagine there are going to be too many uh, exploited migrant workers hanging around in internet cafes in Qatar over the next no. while, mm. while there's journalists over there. So that part of the story would be very interesting. I think a lot of them have been sent home. Yeah. Is the reporting. But it would be very interesting to find out you know, I think it would be very hard to cover, and I say this from the luxury of not having to go and cover, yeah. but it would be very hard to go to Qatar and cover the football without covering the story of the venue. And and I think the point that Tommy Conlon makes in his piece in Sun Independent today is that for all that Qatar have tried to achieve by hosting the World Cup, they have brought more and more scrutiny on themselves. Well, um, I've, been, I've been saying this for a while and thinking it for a long time. Like, sports washing is a defunct term. Yeah. It, it is counterproductive if that's what they're trying to do and he makes the point I mean, like I, I I don't know about you guys I didn't know anything about Qatar I must say really before it got the World Cup and now I must know more about it than uh, most countries over the last couple of years so he said if it's sports washing if that's what they're trying to do then he says it would be a show of lunacy they didn't have an image to clean up because they didn't have an image at all nobody knew or cared about this sand swaddled enclave in the back of beyond uh, most people wouldn't have been able to pick it out in a map. They had nothing to wash. Qatar was an empty clothesline. So he's saying, I mean, it's not about sports washing. Uh, so he says it's not about any of that stuff. He says the acquisition of World Cup or an Olympics by these regimes is not an exercise in soft power, but a demonstration of a chilling will to exercise power. It's a declaration of might, a naked exhibition of pathological vanity and narcissism. And that is really, I think, it for me. Uh, this is, we are not changing. This, 
this is how powerful we are. Yeah, that I we can break all these social norms, I, that we can have 6,500 worker deaths on our hands and who's going to stop us? I think part of this is they learned from sports washing and thought, well, we don't have to we don't have to do all the things that go along with it. We don't have to do what Beijing did and like make it a lovely event and yeah. a spectacle. They're doing none of that. There's going to be absolutely no fun or spectacle to be had at this World Cup. They're charging astronomical fees for any hospitality place in Qatar to show the matches. So there's no there's no fan experience. Like there's nothing going into this to say like we want people leaving here thinking we're a great bunch of lads. You know, there's none of that. So they learned like how to get how to get in through the sports washing uh, and now have just changed it into something completely different. And I think people are so aware of that. So the, the lack of coverage, I think, is part of an uncomfortableness. Yeah, I think so. About it. Um, you have to have conversations about, like I've definitely had more conversations last week with football people about the FIFA documentary on Netflix mm. than I have about whether Trent Alexander-Arnold will will play for England, you know? And that's probably the only bit of football talk that has come through. Mm. Um, Is it any good? Is yeah, the, the, the first couple of episodes, um, like it, Is it it's... Just, a, it's is it the, just about them buying it? Yeah, I think that it's probably for non-football people a lot of stuff, like they go back to like um, how nations were always used to to win votes and to get onto executives and you know um being like the, the apartheid stuff being very center to you know getting african nations to 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 vote for you and always using kind of different um nations in different situations to the developed countries um so i think it gives a lot of people a lot of background to how this stuff can happen and how it just continued to bleed and bleed into the organization mm. um but for non-football people, I think the Qatar thing is really interesting to them. And so they're learning a lot about the corruption in football through that lens. So I think come Sunday week, we will actually start talking about the football. I'm not sure how much fun there will be in it unless the matches like really excite us. I think it will eventually turn to the football because it kind of, it's a big beast. Oh, it, it will definitely eventually. Will. There's definitely but there's an uncomfortableness right now going into it. There's a, there's a novelty, that, uh, like, you know, we all like watching sport and it's November and the sport isn't great and four World Cup matches on a day has a very obvious appeal. Yeah. So then we all have to ask ourselves, well, are we being complicit then? Because, like, what effect is it really having on us where the venue is if you're, you know, like if Messi, if Argentina were in the World Cup and Messi puts the tin hat on being the greatest player of all time, is that sullied, you know, because he won his in Qatar but Maradona won his in Mexico or, or whatever? Like, like, what difference will it have on the competition itself um, other than the damage that it has done to its own reputation and the, the light that it has shone on its own reputation in Qatar? Because, um, like the documentary as well showed that okay Qatar may well have bought the World Cup but they were only using already established methods of securing the World Cup. I like I don't think anyone's outraged they bought the World Cup. Yeah. That's just no, how, that's, that's how you get a World works. Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that. But it's it's needlessly having seven thousand deaths on your hands and treating people in a subhuman fashion. Yeah, and saying things like the homophobic comments that they come out with, it's like what you were saying. They're like, we don't care what you think mm. of us. We don't. We don't care. We're not changing. We've got money. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, you're coming to to our place. We had an interesting. Um, our climate change reporter Lauren was um, for the journal was in COP in Egypt for COP twenty seven, and I asked her to go visit the Qatar Pavilion um, because myself and Gav Cooney from the forty two had an interesting interesting conversation about um, how they've claimed that this is like a net zero World Cup, okay. but they're starting the clock from the minute the first football gets kicked rather than like <laughs> when, when they started building stadiums and flying people in. Um, and Lauren went to the Qatar Pavilion and she said half of the very, very extensive pavilion that they had was taken up with World Cup um, talk and paraphernalia. And she said they had mini models of each of the new stadiums. So showing off this like new city of stadiums they, they had. So she said it was completely against the spirit and the nature of all the other pavilions, even in the big admitter pavilions. Like, you know, they, they do they do the show. They do, they're like, yeah. this is what we're doing. Whereas actually Qatar were just showing off like their World Cup wares. And as a she's a non-football person and she was completely fascinated by this idea that they would come to COP just to show off yeah. the, the fact that they have the World Cup and they built all of these stadiums. Well, the, the big question that like and, uh, Tommy addressed it there and you addressed it, Joe, as well, is like, you know, what is it that Qatar are trying to do? Like, is it, we are powerful. Yeah, is it a display of might? Like that, is, that is the question. I was even, the, and it's funny, like, 
they've just brought so much attention to themselves. The Observer last week, it was an amazing piece. You should dig it out, the extent to which Qatar money has hoovered up property around the UK. Right, okay. You know, the fifth biggest landowner in the UK. Something outrageous. None of these things were on display or being examined before. I, it's naked power. Uh, Tommy calls it a certain narcissism. It is all of that. Like, it's not, we want you to think we're great. No. It is, look how powerful we are. Because mm. when you think about it, like, some of the, some of the most uh, ghostly looking pictures you can ever see is uh, as of, um, if, you, if you Google it, I think there's a website that has a great uh, a collage of it's stadiums that have been built for things like World Cups specifically. And then it's so, it, it, it's, it's remarkable how quickly a stadium that isn't used becomes overgrown. Rock and, rain, and yeah. It's, oh, yeah. Some of the stadiums that Ireland played in in 2002 in Japan, like they, yeah. they look, and like they, Qatar literally building them for two matches. Like. Yeah, some of them are in Rock and Rain before the competitions even start, like yeah. the Olympics in Rio, like the, because the, the stadiums aren't finished properly, they never get finished properly. <laughs> so they're kind of like in destruct, destruction mode, dilapidation before yeah, it like it, it even starts. So um, yeah, it's, I think all of this will add to the World Cup not being as much fun no. and I don't think there'd be an asterisk beside Messi's World Cup if he wins it but I think it will be less fun for everybody like there will be no fan experience there'll be no I can't imagine there'll be joy on the streets in Qatar there'll be joy on the streets in Argentina but I don't think it'll translate in the no. same way It's a shame just that it's just it's, it's a shame that Ireland aren't in it not just because we'd obviously like to see Ireland in it but I think then we could properly gauge like we would have a proper comparison for how this tournament is different because of the venue. You know, it, it, it's very hard to kind of gauge the extent to which people are properly into the football side of things mm. uh, when your own team aren't involved. In it. I like Messi. You know, visit Saudi Messi. Yeah, like he's pocketing hundreds of millions. But when you think about it, like, Qatar already year. have the three highest profile players in the tournament on their books: yeah. Neymar, Mbappe, and Messi. So, mm. um, yeah. And like David Beckham, the David Beckham can't is stomach him. So disappointing. He, it's just horrific. And just to circle back to the conversation we were having about Premier League players not coming out, like David Beckham cannot be an LGBT ally now. No. no, like he just can't, and he will probably come out with nonsense. And he, I'm sure his team have done the the analysis, thinking, but this is worth it. It's not going to actually come back on you. But imagine thinking I could come out but David Beckham's doing this yeah. like it's oh. and like in Tommy's piece for instance and this comes with a trigger warning it, it relates to sexual assault so if you want to flick off for a moment if that's not something you want to hear I totally understand so I mean just in the midst of his piece there's just a chilling paragraph where he says news reports emerged last week in which a man, an office worker in Doha, alleged that he was lured in 2018 via a gay dating app to a hotel room where he was confronted by six Qatari police officers. He alleges they took turns raping him. He was then taken to a police station for questioning homosexuality illegal in the state. He was deported back to the Philippines. So I don't know... Um, and what's very what disappointing as well is, you know, uh, uh, the reports even in the British Home Office, you know, the advice that they're giving... Mm. Like, whatever about okay, these people are hosting the tournament and people are going to go to the tournament and these are the laws that they have. But it seems to be that other governments and other organising bodies are kind of saying, well, look, these lads put up the money, so we kind of have to play ball with them. Like, the British Home Office's advice was, if you're gay and you go to Qatar, just try not to be too gay. Don't basically. be gay. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's basically what they're trying to say. So, like, it, it, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, a tacit acceptance, really, of what oh, yeah. Qatar yeah. are putting out there because people who are in power to have some sort of say over the over the the behavior of people over there aren't actually wielding but, that power. But that's why it's this power play like it's it's like a bully not wanting a toy that you have but taking it because you want it. It's like, "Oh, you guys love the World Cup. Oh yeah, we'll have that." Like we don't we don't want to make it fun and we don't want to make it good. We don't really care if we do well in it. Mm -hmm. Like but we but we want it. Like it, it's it's that kind of the vibe mm -hmm. from it. Like the people I do really feel really sorry for is Wales. Like that this should be yeah. this should be an Italian ninety vibe for Wales and like I've heard from people who are going over who are going to Dubai, like staying in Dubai and then flying into Qatar for the, There's a lot of that, the yeah. matches and yeah. then coming back like that that's how they're going to experience the World Cup, um, like that that's not what you want for the first time going to a World Cup in whatever fifty six years is it like? <laughs> yeah, Doctor wouldn't have done it in the van anyway. No. Yeah. yeah, very grim. That is really the opposite to watching David Clifford play that conversation so thank you very much Sinead O'Carroll from the journal Conor McKeown from the Irish Independent appreciate it guys cheers thanks for having us